Um, so welcome, folks. Um, I think we're all definitely aware of the context of the event, but I think we'll just begin by uh, introducing our fantastic slate of colleagues and panelists. You've had a chance to chat amongst yourselves about who you are. I'll just speak very briefly, like literally 60 seconds, about this sort of the impetus of this conversation and the kinds of tensions and dynamics that I think might emerge just from having read some of the literature that incited the conversation. And um, I think then we will just begin to progress through the brief presentations. Um, there's a collective decision to be made about whether we have uh, a full discussion after each uh, presentation. I'd like to suggest that what we might do after each brief presentation, we have a couple of preliminary remarks, um, but that I will do the work of constraining and containing that because I think some of the most interesting discussion will probably happen at the end of the brief presentations when we have the capacity for sort of the synthesis and synergy between the, what, we, what we've heard. But I do recognize that sometimes that there, there might be something that we absolutely need to sort of land into that particular moment as you're thinking it. Um, my name is David Fancy. I'm with the Department of Dramatic Arts. Um, I'm a member of the post Humanist Research Institute. This event is, of course, a uh, sort of a joint conversation, uh, co-sponsored event between the post Humanist Research Institute and Environmental Sustainability Research Center. And uh, there have been previous sort of conversations between these groups. And this is part of a long-standing set of generative conversations there. I'm just going to briefly run through who the panelists are, and then uh, beginning with Jessica, uh, Blythe, ask her to talk a little bit about her work, and then we'll move down the road. So we have Jessica Blythe, who's assistant professor with Earth, uh, Earth Sciences. The okay, so that's um, perfect. So you're with the Environmental Sustainability Research Center, as is Julia Baird, uh, who's also with the Department of Geography and Tourism Studies. Uh, we have Ryan Plummer, who's a um, professor here, obviously, and the director of the SRC. Uh, Christine Degla, um, who's professor of philosophy and director of the Posthumanist Research Institute. So thank you to Ryan and Christine for uh, initiating this. And uh, then Trevor, who is um, with the Department of Educational Studies and a PRI member as well. So with that in mind, um, perhaps I'll just invite, starting at this end of the table, if you could just give us a brief introduction of your research at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I know many of you in the room, um, so I'll try not to repeat myself, but um, my uh, uh, disciplinary training is in geography. And specifically, I'm a human geographer, so I apply um, social science methods to ask questions about how humans both create and then respond to environmental change. So um, I'm largely embedded in the um, theory of resilience um, and that, that body of literature. I, I've worked on, um, uh, particularly on coastal communities. That's where a lot of my empirical work is based. And I've worked on um, how communities adapt, how they perceive their challenges that they're adapting to, what types of um, actions are available to them. And then most recently, um, I've switched from a focus on adaptation to a, this focus on transformation. So that's the word I'll be tackling today. Perfect, thank you. Um, yeah, so I, uh, in addition to being um, an assistant professor in two units, uh, I'm also a Canada Research Chair in Human Dimensions of Water Resources and Water Resilience. And from the title, you can guess that my research focuses on water resources, and specifically kind of the, the human side of that. So how we make decisions about our, our water resources, what type of actions we take, um, and what's appropriate given you know, the, the current situation that we find ourselves in being in the Anthropocene and the challenges and potential opportunities that that creates for us. Um, so like Jessica, I work primarily with this idea of resilience um, and social ecological resilience in particular. So acknowledging that human and environmental systems are inextricably intertwined. Um, and my word that I'll be talking about is resilience. Thank you. Julia Bryan. Sure, so most of, of my time is spent uh, with the Joyful Task of Administration and more recently with our efforts to get a PhD program up and running. And so I, I feel, uh, I guess, uh, inadequate compared to my colleagues here with their strong focus on research of late. Um, but most of my uh, joy in my life comes from working with my graduate students and, and their focus on stewardship. And so that'll be the word that I'm tackling today. Perfect, thank you, Christine. 
Uh, yes, um, I'm, I'm working mostly recent, um, in recent years I've been developing a research program that tackles posthumanism and most specifically questions about selfhood identity, whether that's even possible in that kind of theoretical framework and um, trying to think about vulnerability. And in relation to vulnerability, I um, tackle questions that pertain to, po uh, to environmental post-humanities. Um, so this is how I got to be interested in the issue of sustainability and how we think about it. So that's what I will share about. All right, thank you. And Trevor. All right, I'm Trevor Norris from the Faculty of Education. Uh, where I teach generally courses on philosophy of education and political theory of political philosophy. Uh, so today my word is consumerism, so I've been working on that topic uh, for a couple of years now. Um, in a broad sense, but more recently with respect to questions about the idea of the student as a consumer and what that means if, if uh, students are consumers of learning or have a consumer relationship with their teachers or their institution or their professors, uh, what are the implications of that perspective? So we're going to be talking a bit more about that. Perfect, thank you. In asking Christine about the impetus for this particular conversation today, right now, she directed me towards a short piece that she, Julia, and Jessica recently published earlier this week in an online uh, forum entitled uh, The Conversation. And the title of this piece is The Meaning of Environmental Words Matters in the Age of Quote Unquote Fake News. And I would encourage you to find this piece uh, and to look at it as a complement to what we're discussing today. But a number of key tensions and questions arise and indeed sort of assertions about the significance of clarity's definition, about the ways in which certain uh, logics, uh, be they capitalist logics of continued exploitation or post-capitalist po uh, politics, sort of dynamics and ethics of different forms of sustainability and non-exploitive relationships between humans and uh, other than human uh, entities on the planet emerge. The question of disciplinary ownership around certain types of terminologies I think becomes a key question that is invoked in this piece that I think will inform us this afternoon. Also, I think it behooves us to think about the situation in which we are having this conversation in a academic context. Of course, not all of us are defined, none of us are defined entirely by the academic valences that mark our existence. We are also citizens, we are participants in a range of different uh, types of communities and relationships with environments. But as we look at the work of translating the kinds of sophisticated, necessarily sophisticated, theoretical and research conversations that we have in this context, how do we best communicate uh, and transmit the discoveries that are made in this context to contexts outside, who, as uh, our colleagues argue, really can benefit significantly from clear definitions, clear semantics. So with that in mind as a sort of a set of contextual dynamics, I think we might begin with the order of the slides. I don't think they necessarily align with the way in which we're sitting, so productive chaos um, <laughs> and engendered at this moment. And we'll begin with the first word, resilience. Well then, you know, I'll encourage you after each brief uh, presentation to chat for 60 seconds with your neighbor about your relationship with that particular term. We'll drop one or two observations into the conversation. Collectively, then we'll move to the next term. That means we're building up a bit of momentum of reflection that we've shared in a smaller uh, kind of uh, forum, and then we'll be able to entertain a much uh, broader debate following that. So beginning then with uh, resilience. Okay, so that's me. Um, if you look at the slide directly above my head there, um, you'll notice that there are no scholarly references there and that's done for reason. It's to highlight that resilience has really um, taken hold outside of academia and there are some important kind of considerations that come with uh, a term that has multiple meanings um, being used very widely. Um, by uh, many different sectors of society. Um, and so that's what I'll explore a little bit today. 
Um, so, and making some linkages to some of the text that you'll see up there, Time Magazine predicted resilience would be the environmental buzzword of 2013, and I don't think that we've seen that abate since 2013. Um, the term's popularity has only grown since then, and there's some prominent examples from the Rockefeller Foundation's 100 Resilient Cities, um, and the use of water resilience as a platform and a framing for the US EPA's guidance for water utility managers. So this is a term that's being used um, to guide decisions um, and to govern uh, at various levels. Apparently, we increasingly want resilience, um, but it's important to know what exactly we're, we're talking about when we say that word. Um, so I thought it would be useful to, um, to explore kind of two dimensions of the, the um, challenges that come with, with the term that has multiple meanings. One is um, looking at the roots of the term and how these multiple meanings have maybe emerged. And second, um, a historical lack of attention to the um, value-laden nature of this term. Um, so, first of all, in exploring the problems with resilience, um, it's useful to look at its roots. And from a scholarly perspective, um, this term is situated in at least two very different fields, um, psychology and ecology. There are, are others, um, but those are the two that I'm going to focus on today. So they provide some, some first hints about how differently the term resilience can be interpreted as both an individual and a system level trait. Um, focusing specifically on the evolution of the term resilience from its ecological beginnings uh, provides further hints about how resilience is used in an environmental context. And um, if some of you are SAS students and um, you've probably heard uh, the name Buzz Hauling, um, who's widely considered a key foundational thinker of resilience. Um, he described two and later three types of resilience that have uh, very different kind of um, meanings associated with them. And they relate to my object that I brought, which we didn't really talk about. But um, if we want to send this around, it's a ball in a cup. Um, and I'll explain what that means. Just knows already. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, these three different meanings of resilience are first, one that's focused specifically on recovery from change, and it's generally called engineering resilience. Um, if we use this ball in a cup um, as kind of a metaphor for resilience, the ball represents our system, our social ecological system, or depending on how resilience is interpreted, maybe just the, the, the ecological system or components of it. Um, and the cup represents kind of a, a stability domain, it's called. So a range of potential ways in which the system can be configured. Um, and so when a disturbance happens, pushing that ball maybe up the side of the cup, um, it, resilience from this first perspective, from an engineering perspective, is how long it takes to get back to the bottom at equilibrium. Um, the second... Uh, kind of type of resilience is called ecological resilience. And it's one that's focused more on ecosystem and ecosystems and adaptation. So this type of resilience acknowledges that there may actually be more than one stability domain. So there may be multiple cups at different levels, and the ball can move from one cup to another if the disturbance is big enough. Um, and that the sides of the cup can actually be manipulated a little bit. So depending on what's happening in the ecosystem, the side of the cup may actually make it easier for the ball to move from one stability domain into another. The third type is called social ecological resilience, and it's focused on the complex interactions between ecosystems and human systems. And so that's closer to kind of how I, the, the, the conceptualization that I, I work with. And that acknowledges that humans and ecosystems are intertwined and that their actions and interactions actually shape those stability domains. So we actually can shape the cup um, and move the system. So we are also moving the ball. Um, further research in this area has highlighted that um, the public and decision makers perceive resilience differently, and this connects to the, the piece that um, Jess and uh, Christine and I wrote, um, and that our neat academic typology of these different types of resilience um, don't really fit with how it's, um, how it's being um, understood in reality. 
Um, one of the studies that I undertook together with several ESRC members um, found that perspectives on how a system should be managed were split evenly among water managers, policymakers, and others between engineering and social ecological systems perspectives. So people may be all using the term resilience, but they may be meaning very different things when they're, when they're using that term. And um, when you think about that and the implications of that, there's the potential for conflict um, and potential for very different outcomes depending on how you understand this term resilience. And the second thing that I wanted to highlight that I didn't touch on in the, in the conversation piece um, is the normative nature of the term resilience. So academics and non-academics alike have historically used the word resilience to imply something positive, something that we want. And you can see that a lot outside of um, academia. When, when we're using the term resilience, it's generally uh, something that we want to attain or build more of. Um, but we haven't really given due attention to the value neutral intentions of those that actually proposed the term resilience. Um, so resilience is really neither good nor bad. It simply is or isn't. Um, this critical oversight has been brought to the fore of scholarship in recent years with prominent figures in, in resilience um, research asking resilience for whom. Um, and one of these key figures, uh, Katrina Brown wrote a really influential paper in uh, Progress in Human Geography a few years ago. Um, and this emphasizes that resilience is not necessarily equal when it's applied um, and that it's not necessarily always a good thing either. Resilience can also entrench us in unsustainable pathways and make it very difficult for us to actually um, build the um, inertia to move out of those unsustainable or undesirable systems. And these are, can be called traps. Um, and if you um, are looking up literature in this area, um, there's, there's a a recent kind of surge in this, this area too. So there's a real danger that enthusiasm around the term and general perceptions outside of academic scholarship and within it um, that we want to be resilient can be used as a tool to further agendas that actually give inadequate attention to the realities of our complex world and the critical importance of thinking about resilience in terms of of what, to what, and for whom. Fantastic. Could we kindly take the ball and cup, which I don't think made its way across the front row of, did it make its way there? No. no. Uh, and circulate it. Again, if we could take the next uh, 60, 90 seconds to confer with the person beside you, and if you're feeling asocial, you don't need to. Um, nothing coercive here. Um, but how this term and the observations that uh, Julie's just shared with us intersect with some of the key concerns that you're engaging with in your own uh, research. It might be very different research, so some conceptual leaps and conceptual generation might be necessary, but I think that could be an interesting part of the exercise. So over to you, and we'll do the same up here.
Um, the suggestion from uh, the organizers was that we bring an object that would help, um, and I think you did that in a really lovely way, that the object sort of was a, very, was a way of just manifesting and rendering material, some of the conceptual concerns, which I think fits in this larger conversation of how to transmit uh, knowledge in a way that is substantive but not necessarily reductive. And so I think that we'll continue with that exploration as we send the objects around. So was there, was there an observation or two? Again, we'll just try to contain this, but uh, does anyone want to fuel um, our, uh, yes? About for resilience. Right? Absolutely. I was wondering a little bit more about resilience traps, what, what uh, that could like elaborate a little bit on what that's, uh, what that means. Just, oh, please, yeah. Do you want to respond now? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Let's have a response <laughs> yeah, now, sure. and then we'll move on to the next. Let's yeah, okay. so um, uh, it's this idea that very unsustainable or undesirable um, kind of systems um, or, or ways that systems are configured can also be very resilient in that it's very difficult to um, to change the change a system, and that in those sorts of situations, resilience is actually not a desirable trait. It's not not um, aiding and moving towards. Um, and I, I'm cognizant of how much I'm using the word sustainable, <laughs> which has its own challenges. Um, but this notion that um, you know we may be stuck. Uh, and it can be very difficult to push that ball out of that cup if it's not a good cup to be in. Perfect. So would nuclear waste be an example of that? Um, it could be, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's move to the next uh, slide, um, please. Okay, thank you. Perfect, over, over to you. Yes, thank you. Um, all right, I'd like to start by a show of hands. Uh, who in the room feels that we are on um, a positive track towards better futures? Okay, so me too. <laughs> and we have good reason in 2019 to feel concerned about the trajectories that we are on as a planet. You know, there are headlines that are uh, very alarming and difficult to process, such as the UN is asking us to um, consider our own extinction. We're talking about that scale of magnitude. So one of the pieces of evidence that gives us cause to feel genuinely concerned about the future is um, in October, the IPCC published their special report 15, which is the um, report on global warming of 1.5 degrees. So uh, in one thing that that report highlights is according to our best climate scientists um, working collaboratively across all countries, we've got about 12 years to get ourselves on track to meet the 1.5 degree target, after which point we cross that over and catastrophic events begin to happen. So that's the best available science that we have. Um, that report also concludes that meeting that target within the next 12 years of that 1.5 degree temperature threshold and this is a quote, um, would require rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented change in all aspects of society. So we're thinking about the extinction of the human species, potentially, and what our scientists are calling for is unprecedented change. So that is what sort of fuels this notion of transformation from the perspective of many environmental thinkers. So we're talking about the fact that we are not in a state where we can um, any longer just adapt. We need something bigger than that because what we've been doing is just keeping us going down this trajectory towards potentially catastrophic change in many of our systems. Um, so what transformation means, and I think why it can be quite inspiring, and one of the reasons that I am attracted to it as a, as a researcher, is we need something big and something radical and something different. We're not talking about building seawalls to protect us from flooding. We're talking about rethinking the structures that our societies are based on. So this is thinking about new economic models. This is thinking about maybe degrowth models. It's thinking about carbon-free um, societies. It's things like um, a universal basic wage, those types of changes are of that magnitude. So um, to help get our heads around the kind of scale of change that is being called for by the IPCC and is potentially embodied in the word transformation, um, it's helpful to think about three historic transformations that have happened in our societies. Um, and it brings me to my object, which is a chicken. 
<laughs> which is maybe weird, but let me explain. Um, there have been sort of three major shifts in our societies historically. So the first sort of system that you can think about is we existed as hunter-gatherers. And as a hunter-gatherer, you would not have been able to foresee what an agriculturally based society would look like. So that's what the chicken represents, is domestication of animals. So when we moved from hunting and gathering to staying put and growing our own food, that was a massive transformational change in the way that we are structured as a society. So the second um, major transformation that we highlight historically is then when we move from an agriculturally based society to an industrial society. You know, so the same thing if you were a farmer plowing your fields with the help of animals and not mechanized, it would have been impossible to envision what industrialization would have done to our society. So. I personally find that um, inspiring because when we're thinking we're in pretty bad shape and we need something to change in the future, it's got to be bigger than we can actually imagine right now. So the, the, that, I guess, is what fuels this notion of transformation. <coughs> so um, going to the quote at the top of the page, Mark Kelling, who is a really influential um, writer and thinker about climate change in particular based in the UK, he writes this quote, transformation breathes. And what he means there is that word and this idea that we need something big is being picked up by mainstream um, academics, but outside of academia as well. So it's no longer this sort of radical notion in the fringes of academia, but it's now gone kind of viral, if you will. So the pictures are examples of the way the word is being picked up and used um, in, in many different contexts. So the first one there on the left are the um, sustainable development goals. And the whole purpose of that is framed under transforming our world. So that's the headline goal of the next 15 years of our global efforts towards sustainability. Um, the middle picture there is uh, one of the three pillars of Future Earth. So Future Earth is this international research conglomerate that's very action oriented, very well funded, very influential. And one of the three focal areas for the next 15 years or so is the notion of transformation. And then the third picture there is um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's most recent assessment report, which is the AR5, it came out in 2014, it had an entire chapter devoted to transformation for the first time. So it was the first time that word has been really picked up by the IPCC. But these are examples just to um, hopefully convince you that the word is being used um, quite broadly now and it's being sort of one of these buzzwords, it's become one of the buzzwords. There's ministries of transformation that are popping up all over the place, so governments are picking it up. So hopefully you're convinced that it's here. The second half of that um, <clears throat> quote says, transformation breathes, it has entered the life cycle of dangerous words. So what he's referring to by that is the fact that once a word becomes mainstreamed, it then embodies a lot of extra um, power and influence and potentially those can be associated with quite big consequences or risks as well. So that's the dangerous part that he refers to. So um, <clears throat> building on this idea that when words become very popular and they become sort of the buzzword of the day, um, that they have potential risks associated with them, I um, co-wrote a paper with um, a really great group of thinkers that's listed on the bottom here called the dark side of transformation. So essentially what we were responding to is this normative assumption that everybody wants to transform, let's all transform. Um, it's trying to say, okay, but let's proceed cautiously because there are some risks associated with this term. So in the paper that we just had come out in the conversation, um, our point is that words matter, the meaning of words matters because how we use them shapes how we think, which in turn shapes how we act. And so when you're thinking about transformation, the way it's used has policy implications and has real world implications for where funding gets put, what types of actions are prioritized and that kind of thing. So um, just to wrap up, I guess in this paper, we highlight five risks that are associated with this term. Um, just to give you an example of one of them, the first risk that we highlight is that this transformation sort of buzz um, risks shifting the burden of response onto already vulnerable parties. So for example, um, Often it's core rural communities that are asked to be doing the transformation when they are already the most vulnerable communities anyway. So there is a risk that this word and its new sort of um, appeal just adds extra burden onto their plates. So a very concrete example is the UK government in 2011 um, commissioned a big review of how our best 
uh, what are the best strategies to respond to climate change? And in the report, it says that migration can be a transformational strategy, um, which may represent one of our best options going forward. But from the point of view of a climate refugee or someone who has lost your home to sea level rise, migration, forced migration, is probably not going to be perceived as a positive transformational strategy. It's probably the worst case scenario. You have to leave your home, you have to leave everything you've known, it's a risk to your culture, to your sense of place. Um, so uh, in summary, this article is just asking us to think carefully about how the word is being used and to be cautious of the momentum that is building behind it um, and, and to think carefully. Perfect. Thank you, Jessica. So. Um, over to you folks again for the second brief discussion. If you're beginning to exhaust the potentials of the person beside you, don't uh, feel slightly, don't feel shy to move and chat somewhere else that keeps things like that. Um, I'm sure, I know, I know, I'm sure there's a very positive way of framing that. Uh, just speak to your itinerary. Um, so over to you folks, and we'll do the same. Yeah, that's, I, that's, that's <laughs> I like the marketing. Yeah, no, I actually got a good choice for the from us so that we're sort of foreshadowing the eventual broader conversation we're going to have. Is there a question or an observation that we could just uh, land um, at this end of the table from, from you folks here? Something that really struck you, maybe something, perhaps it isn't even a question, maybe it's just a brief observation of some, you know, micro or macro epiphany you had in the face of um, what, the, what the previous speaker which you just said. I notice you're getting your chicken back. <laughs> My kids will be happy. Okay. No observations? Okay, let's move to the next slide then, the sustainability. Okay. Um, well, in environmental discourses, sustainability is conceived as the ability of a given ecosystem to maintain its essential functions and processes over time. Um, the term itself, um, I, as a philosopher, I often do that. I go back to Latin or Greek. So um, in Latin, sustenere really means to hold up or to bear or to endure. So I think it's, it's um, you know, it's not super enlightening to think about that, but interesting. 
Many international documents and development projects rely on a different definition of sustainability that directly points to human environmental management, such as to secure access to natural resources for future generations of humans. Such concepts of sustainability emerged in the influential environmentalist article, A Blueprint for Survival, that dates from 1974. So when we use the word sustainability, we think about it as pertaining to humans. Most imagery reflects that as the top left one on my slide indicates, right? You have human hands, they're holding a bubble, presumably it's where we live, there's a tree, there's lots of green, there's blue. Um, humans are looking after things. Um, now, what that reflects is that sustainability is for and by humans. It's for humans and it's brought about by humans. Um, and this, of course, rests on a humanist anthropocentric view that posits that the human has a duty of care and stewardship, we'll hear about stewardship, um, and has the technological and scientific knowledge to use resources in a sustainable manner to ensure its own survival. Um, and it also is modeled on the economy of debt and inheritance, which I won't talk about, but perhaps we can come back to in the discussion, the general discussion later. Um, so for example, extracting less resources to produce sturdier and more sustainable objects and tools that we may need, such as a stapler, would be the right sustainable course of action. Now the objects I brought um, is a stapler. I say objects I brought is um, because I cheated a little and I brought two to make my point. Um, the one was fabricated in the, in the 1940s in Sweden and the other in very recent years in, well, who knows where because I I looked it up and I couldn't find, like that company just won't tell you where they make their things. So let's just assume China. Um, we, we can see and feel the difference in product material and sturdiness and they're going around. So you can weigh them, you know, you can look at them and uh, see how they work. Um, the more recent one is the hardest to open actually to, to feed staples to. Um, and um, one appears to be produced to endure, so the metal one, the older one, while the other does not. Um, the metal stapler is sustainable while the other isn't. And miracle of miracles, no one has changed the size of staples, so you can still use the old one and feed it with staples you buy downstairs at the bookstore. So producing and a sturdier and enduring stapler goes along with how we think of sustainability in terms of the well-being of future generations and their accessibility to natural resources or a natural environment in which they can flourish and enjoy a healthy life. Um, that is also the spirit of the witty sentence um, that, um, that you see on the slide there that was painted on a wall of a hotel that I was staying at in Amsterdam. Um, the hotel as a whole had a chocolate team, um, colors and all kinds of quotes on walls and everything. And, and this painted sentence in particular uh, was on point, I thought, because I was there to talk on the Anthropocene at a conference. So I snapped a picture. Um, and of course, most humans like chocolate. Um, so, you know, this is a fun sentence, save the earth, it's the only planet with chocolate. Um, so humans like chocolate, but it's not as clear whether non-human animals um, really care much for it at all. Um, so as witty as it is, this sentence is an instance of human exceptionalism, uh, believing that our needs, our desires, and our likes are more valuable than those of other species. It is at the heart of our common understanding of sustainability. But according to posthumanist thinkers, human exceptionalism and the notion of the human as master or steward is problematic um, because we fail to value other beings in the way we should um, and we fail to understand ourselves as radically entangled with all other beings when we conceive of ourselves as exceptional. So posthumanists want to ask sustainability for whom? 
An inclusive post-human approach to sustainability would decenter the human, reposition it in its ecosystem, and foster the thriving of all instances of life while acknowledging differences between those. This position entails a rejection of our current practice of thinking of uh, non-human others as resources, which we must exploit in a sustainable manner, uh, be they non-human animals, plants, ecosystems, min minerals, or the earth system as a whole. So from a post-humanist perspective, we can ask what would justify working towards sustaining a being that, is, um, that has proven itself to be so harmful to itself and to others. Um, and as Nietzsche puts it, I can't evade Nietzsche ever, um, but he has this wonderful quote which I think captures it. He says, the earth has a skin and this skin has diseases. One of these diseases, for example, is called man. The disease here is the man of humanist philosophies, the, the master and steward, the one that thinks itself to be exceptional. Or, um, perhaps quite literally the human being. Um, Post-humanist sustainability is related to an ethics of extinction in which the survival of the human is no longer prioritized. Um, if we were to become extinct as a species, things would go on and non-humans would thrive. Grass would take over an abandoned truck, um, like on this picture on my slide, and non-human animals would make it their home. Post-human sustainability practices are oriented not towards a future conceived in a linear fashion, but rather emerging from the entanglement of beings and the plurality of temporal dimensions of the past, present, and futures. And also it's different scales, uh, that's an important point. So geological time, human time, and beast time are not the same. Um, when we think of sustainability, we must think of temporality as well and how our temporality is intertwined and dependent on the temporality of other beings. Some future generations are right now and not in 10 years or so. The future is not heterogeneous and there is much violence that occurs whenever our future becomes more important or worth protecting than that of other beings. So that's my thoughts. Perfect. Thank you, Christine. Um, so back over to us. Um, we'll take a, another couple of moments. I scramble a lot. Well, because don't you find when you work a lot on something, it's incredibly hard to just and think about your chance. I'm not so alarmed by it myself anymore because the ticket is just screwing up so bad. Yeah. I, I think there's lots of interesting stuff that's being written by extinction and actually calling it an ethics of extinction. Some people going so far as to say, well, maybe we need to seek our own extinction. That's the ethics of it's the only
Well, you have competing interests, right? Like the bees and the plants. And of course, they're going to be the benefit they award. I mean, they have interests too. We have interests that are I think it's no longer. I think it's no longer. I think it's no longer. Since they had a meeting and they have interests and they, they have desires and likes and, and, and things that work for them, things that, that um, support their flourishing, things that, that stop their flourishing. And so if we're going to say, well, we need to allow for flourishing for their policies as well, well, that might end up having to be taken out of the equation. I struggle with the Okay, so we will have more for an observation or a question. Remembering, of course, we've got lots of time to do so later, but there might be an absolutely burning pressing concern at the moment. Are we being incredibly sort of gracious to you? Um, in response to Christine, your object, I was just thought it was interesting that this is kind of an idea that seems to be on a lot of people's minds. I was listening to the BBC last week and they had a story that a new EU directive that they're proposing is going to would encourage companies or compel them to make products that are more sustainable particularly products that can be fixed when they break. Mm -hmm. And so they were interviewing these people that this phenomenon of pop-up shops where people bring their broken items and then a community knowledge is pulled to fix it. And this idea that people bring a lot of tech items and <coughs> land obsolescence is built into the item or the item is unable to be open and things like that. Like so this. Well, I think some, yeah, I don't know if that can be opened at the Apple store or something, but. Only, I, only by an Apple genius, right? Um, so there's, so there's, isn't that how they're called? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's a question that that inhibits the maintenance of these machines over a long period of time. And so this EU directive, I guess, would be an update on an earlier directive that said that these appliances have to be more environmentally uh, efficient. And so this would update that and also need to be able to be repaired to last longer because a huge amount of waste in landfills is these types of planned obsolescent home appliances and things like that. Mm -hmm. Well, if I, if I can just say a few words. Um, what's interesting about those objects is that um, I had a stapler that broke, and so I went to the bookstore and got this one. And this one, actually, I, I bought as an antique, as a decoration for my bookshelf. I didn't realize it was even functional and, and until I tried for this. And I'm like, oh, look at this. And whoa, staples are the same size. I didn't purchase it to be a stapler. I purchased, I purchased it as a decoration. So, you know, like this is so ingrained into, like I never thought that an old stapler would do the work. Now I'm like, now I have two staplers. That's silly, right? Um, <laughs> but, but I, yeah, and I think, um, you know, that this whole idea of repair is also very interesting because we, we don't think about, well, do I have an old object that could do the work? Um, can I fix something that I own or, and that goes um, that breaks and, and you know there's often a tendency to just throw away also because um, things are so cheap which I think is the perfect segue. Mm -hmm. Precisely to, let's move to the next term. To thank consumerism. You. Right, thank you. Yes. In fact it's such a good segue that I'm tempted to steal these and reuse. <laughs> <laughs> I have to talk about in a second but the last point you're making I think is perfect that one of the features of consumerism is that uh, more money is put into turning objects into signs or symbols and actually making them functional. So I think it's a, a good example that we have something that's been around for decades and still works and something that probably a lot more money went into the design and marketing of this object than any expectation that it would actually work and, and have a, uh, be able to continue to be used for a long time. So that's actually a good uh, example of consumerism. But the one I brought actually is this. Can anybody name what this is? Oakleaf? Oak leaf? Oak leaf. Right, it's not a, what's that? 
Uh, actually, that's actually a good, a good segue. Okay, so what I was going to say is um, those that knew attend Oak would be in the minority among uh, K-12 students today. Um, so most, there's a study done of uh, students in a school in Brooklyn of the uh, leaves on the trees on the school property. And most of the students in that school couldn't name uh, any of those leaves. But looking at the, the overhead, the first word consumerism, where it's made up of letters from different corporate logos, those same students were able to name the uh, brand or logo where all of those letters had come from. So I think that's a good example of what we can point to as a decline of maybe eco-literacy or an environmental literacy, uh, which you obviously have quite a bit and far more than, than I do. Uh, and it be, it's being displaced by what we could call commercial literacy or consumer literacy, that we know more about the different products we use and their meaning and their, uh, the associations we have with them whether they be the jingles that are used in, in commercials or the images, uh, then we do have the natural world around us. So that's something that, that's good. Uh, okay, so consumerism, I think, is one of the definitive features of our culture. Uh, and I've been studying it for a while, but it's, in a way it's kind of currently being displaced a little bit by the rise of populism, uh, at least in the popular media, and at least with respect to the politics of consumerism. But I think despite the kind of uh, prevalence of populism, all we have to do is look to the spread of consumerism around the world uh, for a pretty good evidence of its pervasiveness and persistence. Uh, so I'm gonna raise, uh, there's so many things I could say about it, but I'm just gonna focus on four different features or different aspects of consumerism. Uh, and so my starting point is gonna be that I think we should, we can think of consumerism as a being about shopping and buying things. But I think we'd be very limited in understanding consumer if we just stopped at that point. So I want to use shopping and purchasing things as kind of a starting point or an entry point to think about consumerism. But I think we should move, uh, move beyond that. So the way that I've written and, and think about consumerism is that it's about more of a worldview or maybe a, more of a way of relating to, to things uh, or a way of relating to people or even a way of relating to yourself. So that's, that's kind of moving a bit beyond just a, a, a literal shopping perspective. So it's a way of being or a way of relating. Uh, it's, and I would add then to that that it's a set of values or beliefs that we bring into all of our relationships. Consumerism is not something outside of us that we can just separate ourselves from. It interpolates us. We take it up and we kind of enact consumerism, not only when we're shopping, but we're, when we're engaging in other, uh, other aspects of our life. So I mentioned earlier that I've also been doing some work on the idea of the student as consumer uh, and what that means um, on an individual sense, but also in a broader social sense. What happens to a culture uh, when more money is spent in that culture on advertising to people than in educating them? And if you look at empirical measurements, despite the 10% uh, reduction to tuition we've, we've heard about uh, recently, um, there's still uh, more money spent advertising to people than educating them. And actually, that said, I want to problematize that distinction and say that in a way, advertising is becoming the new educator. It forms us and forms our values and beliefs as much as the educational system. Uh, okay, so that's the first step is to go to move beyond just shopping. Uh, the second one I'm going to talk about is the politics of consumerism and the idea that one of the implications of the rise of consumerism is that it results in a shift uh, from self-identifying as a citizen to self-identifying as a consumer. And we've seen for a decade or two this uh, discourse taken up by politicians when they refer to people as taxpayers instead of citizens. Uh, what's interesting about that is it's, it's a tendency that in some ways crosses the political spectrum in the sense that uh, what's strange and problematic about consumerism is it's not only people on the right that are talking about people as taxpayers, but it's people on the left also. Um, but it's, it points to the idea of the decline or the erosion of identification as, as a citizen and identification as a consumer, or the idea that we engage in politics as consumers and we, re we expect what you could call a return on investment that voting is a transactional, in a transactional event where we want compensation for or to be rewarded for, uh, even monetarily. Uh, so, that, so that's one of the aspects of the politics of consumers. And the other on a more global perspective is that some have argued that the spread of consumerism internationally uh, was likely to create a global homogeneous culture of consumerism. Uh, 
uh, that we'd all uh, embrace, that we'd all we'd overcome our political differences, we'd overcome nationalism or regionalism or extremism, this kind of thing, uh, because we have a sense of unity through branding or unity through identification with commodities. This is most famous if you remember the uh, Coke commercial from many decades ago, Teaching the World to Sing. That's kind of an obvious example of this ideal of creating a global community unified of uh, consumer satisfaction. But some have argued that the opposite happens, that actually the spread of this, uh, the attempted spread of global cultural homogeneity actually creates the opposite. It creates violent backlashes and attempts to differentiate ourselves from different groups or different cultures. Uh, an attempt to uh, promote regionalism or nationalism as a response to global cultural homogeneity. Um, so that's a, another aspect of the politics, and the last aspect of the politics I'll say is the question, kind of leading into this point, is the question about whether consumerism, what I've implied in a way, is that consumerism may have led to populism. There is this notion that uh, Trump, for example, is authentic, and most other politicians are too, too constructed to image managed, and the, the appeal of Trump was that he seemed to be kind of uh, off the record or unmanaged and therefore authentic. And Hillary Clinton as a counterpart seemed to be so kind of smooth and glossy. And so people are kind of drawn to someone they can quote identify with because they seem authentic. So I think the spread of consumerism into even the marketing and politics and political parties and political campaigns, turning it into an image uh, has provoked an opposite uh, tendency. Um, okay, so I'm going to uh, that's then uh, environmentalist. So the second was politics. The third is uh, environmental perspectives. Uh, one of the features of consumerism, I think, is that if we take on the consumer worldview, we come to see everything that exists in the world as available for us and for that purpose. Everything is out of our, at our disposal and exists for human use. And I think that's what I meant earlier when I said the idea of the consumer worldview. That the consumer worldview is to look at everything as a commodity that's readily available for use. Um, okay, then I'm going to move uh, last to posthumanism, which is a bit of a newer connection for me to connect consumerism and posthumanism. So I'm kind of raising more questions in this uh, last section. Uh, so consumerism is rooted in many assumptions of humanism and coming out of the Enlightenment. The idea of a rational autonomy of the, in, the individual, which is prevalent in economics, the idea that the consumer acts out of rational self-interest. Uh, second, uh, another pattern of instrumentalization of, and objectiv objectivization, which I connect with uh, humanism. And last, the idea of historical progress or historical improvement. We can say that, you know, thank God we no longer live in the Middle Ages. We have a much better standard of living and quality of life and so on and so forth. So there is a belief in the Enlightenment as a part of humanism in the, um, the optimism of human progress. Um, so those are some ways that consumerism is rooted in, in humanism. Um, and some have argued that actually to be a consumer is one of the things that uh, is a definitive experience of being a human or one of the things that, that almost de uh, defines us as being human. To be human is to consume. Uh, so the questions that I'm, I'm wondering about is the question is moving beyond the human in, uh, in, the, in the post human perspective. Uh, are we also then moving beyond consumerism? Uh, does the post human mean post consumerism or the end of the end of consumerism? Or is it simply a different type or configuration or, or arrangement or manifestation of consumerism? Uh, and I wonder, uh, does the non-human consume, or do we, we, we want to develop different categories or conceptions of what it means to consume that we would say is true for the human being, but quite different for an animal, or quite different for a machine or artificial intelligence? Can artificial intelligence be a consumer? Uh, so on the other hand, consumerism entails the consumption of the human being through consumerism. We participate uh, in the disappearance of human subjectivity. Uh, that consumerism is a process of dehumanization because we ourselves as humans are caught up. And what I mean by that is that uh, humans ourselves are rendered as consumables. Uh, Heidegger is one who wrote first about the idea of human resources uh, many decades ago now, but this is a new term that we now, we now think of humans as being resources. So I think what I'm getting at there is the idea of the consumer worldview is something that we might apply to the other or to the outside of human.
But I think we do more than that as a result of the consumerism worldview. We apply it to ourselves and to each other. Uh, we turn ourselves into brands and into images. We market ourselves. Uh, I wrote a paper a while ago about the idea of me incorporated, that education turns you into the CEO of you, and you are a brand, and you have to market yourself on the, in the labor market as a commodity. So that's the kind of the spread of the consumer mentality uh, beyond the natural world and into the human world. Um, so consumerism, I think, is inherently uh, anthropocentric. Uh, because it places us uh, in the center and in a position of dominance. So what does this mean if we're moving into a post-human constellation? Uh, what does this mean uh, for consumers? I think I'll stop. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. And in, uh, I mean, what's your relationship with e-commerce and Amazon? How much, how much embedded is driving technology? How can you help rate it? What's the driver and what's the driver? Consumerism has, has been the impetus for faster delivery, for example, by Amazon, or, or is, is the Amazon just a mechanism by which you're filling those requests to fashion, right? So you can sit at home with something, um, stay with me. Yeah, um, but it's a rough question. So you get the series back. It's Christmas, and you're like pining for months about the boy hacks, and maybe you get one time. And they, you know, they delivered it to a little hardware store. And, store. Store. Right. and so there's, you know, and now, different you know, situations. Right. 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 Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, wait, it's, it's your office yeah. button. Yeah. And I just wonder, yeah. you know, yeah. if you're yeah. 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 where, how do you choose apart that relationship? Because it's almost like a speed bump, right? Oh, there's some speed bump. Yeah. I don't know if we can choose it apart. It's a bit of a chicken leg therapy, right? Ted Rickens, if we weren't so driven by concealment, we would never have become so successful. But then the convenience of it and the algorithmic effectiveness of it, then, you know, it just targets. Like, I can't help it's like, it's like, you know, crackberry, like checking your phone, yeah. right? It's like, you just, it hits a certain percent of the population, you have to check it every minute, and it's like, there are these like, match up all the time. I, I can see it, right? It's like, yeah, it's just so, so much easy. You know, I got Amazon products. And, and all those algorithms are connected. So you shop for something on Amazon, you go on your Facebook, you talk to a friend, and, and you have an ad, and you just, that's the idea of, uh, is, the, is the consumer looking rational, after all? When, uh, I was walking by uh, the Foxy Business community the other day, and I looked in a window, and there's a big cross on near marketing, and they had pictures of the grants just murder everybody, and they had research. Um, I don't think I can't erase it. Um, so that, to me, undermines the whole uh, enlightenment idea of the more rational system. Yeah, we may think we're rational, but what's really being Turn on your computer to work. Up pop back, so actually know you're on Amazon ordering the book that you just saw, right? Yeah. Yeah. Our autonomy has been incredibly ridiculous, but I think understanding our connection with the Recognizing that in a moment um, we'll take all of this um, beneficial pent up conversational um, mm -hmm. and we will unleash it upon ourselves uh, collectively. But uh, we do want to nonetheless insert uh, Ryan's uh, observations into the mix. Uh, then we'll have a final kind of uh, sort of brief conversation about that particular term, and then we'll imagine how we're going to spend the, the remaining uh, time that we have and how we can most effectively organize that around a set of uh, questions and conversations. But over to you. Thanks very much, David, for that warm welcome. And I hate to be the person between pent up conversation and. I'm not sure it is. I'm feeling nervous. But. Um, <laughs> by the way, by the way.
<laughs> yeah, th thank you anyways for the warm welcome uh, and for staging that. And I want to certainly thank uh, Christine, Julie, and Jessica for, for organizing this and also say congratulations for your recent piece that came out and encourage all of you to have a chance to read it. Uh, it really is a, a quite a thought-provoking uh, piece and very topical. Um, my comments today, and I'll keep them brief uh, because I don't want to uh, cause any spillover effect with uh, pan up conversation, uh, is around the idea of stewardship. And I just want to say a little bit about the roots or history of this idea around stewardship, uh, some of the different ways it's being used, and then of course I'll speak to the piece of firewood that I brought in uh, in regards to stewardship. Uh, when, when you know, I was initially approached about being on this panel, I, talking about stewardship, I thought it was um, in some ways ironic uh, for a couple of different reasons, but also really appropriate and fitting. And the appropriateness and fitting has become more apparent to me throughout our conversation so far today. Uh, so I thank all my colleagues for that. Uh, the ironic part for me is that you know we can trace stewardship back to the Old Testament and to particular Indigenous societies. And so the idea of stewardship is not something that's uh, inherently new, and so this idea of a buzzword, or for example, um, the title of consumerism, I didn't even catch on at first that those were actually symbols from uh, from different uh, service providers and manufacturers. And so, for me, as a buzzword, you know, I, I initially think about buzzwords: oh, this is something new that everyone's getting really excited about. And stewardship doesn't, to me, really fit in that category because uh, it's been around for an awful long time. So the more I thought about it though, there are increasingly some ways that, that I think it, it is really appropriate to include it on, on our panel in terms of a buzzword. So first and foremost, um, if we look at, at least in the scholarly sense, uh, the use of stewardship and the attention of stewardship has really sharply been increasing over the last 20 years. And you know, it's, it, there's been a couple uh, recent pieces out that, that have charted, um, I think Brooke sent them to me, charted stewardship. And you know, it's typical one of those hockey stick graphs that you're all familiar with. With the last 20 years, we've seen a, a sharp proliferation in terms of scholarship on, on stewardship. So that's great. Um, the second thing, and, and I have to thank at least three of my colleagues for making connections for me so I didn't have to, uh, which is always convenient being the last speaker. And, and so in addition to the frequency of stewardship really increasing, so is the magnitude. And, and what I mean by that, it's, it's taken on an enhanced urgency uh, as an imperative that we're now facing as we move forward, as we're trying to build resilience for social ecological systems, as we're in the Anthropocene and we're trying to navigate transformations and as we're working towards uh, sustainable solutions. And so much of what we're seeing in, in both scholarship as well as um, society, there's a real effort to engage in stewardship uh, towards sustainable solutions, but also biosphere stewardship, especially as it relates to environmental change. And stewardship's increasingly highlighted as one of the key aspects of what uh, we need to do to make some of those transformational changes in the Anthropocene. So the magnitude of it is, is uh, certainly gaining currency and intensifying. And last but not least, why I think it's, it's a great uh, buzzword to include on this panel is that, uh, like all the others, it is either not defined well at all or very loosely defined, which is a point of ongoing frustration for many scholars and, and yourselves as, as students um, when we start to work with this idea of scholarship. So I think for all those reasons, it fits in quite, quite nicely to our panel discussion today. Um, what I want to do next is just speak a little bit about the way it has been developing and the different ways we're understanding it. And as a, as a starting point, I want to go to uh, with something that Christine mentioned, and um, that's the idea of stewardship as a metaphor. And so in kind of the original colloquial sense um, that we think about the idea of stewardship, there's an obligation that we have to take care of something that we care about. And the quintessential stereotypical writer of stewardship in that vein is all the Leopold is writing around Stan County Almanac and his land ethic. So it's very much tied to an ethic of care that we have about something in particular um, and really highlights this obligation that we have around moral responsibilities for taking care of something. And I couldn't have said it better, and I think since I had my notes out, Christine was probably looking off my notes, but <laughs> we'll let that slide. Um, you know, she, she mentioned, and of course as a philosopher, I said there's actually a number of philosophers here that have raised um, you know, some, some real questions or problematized um, the unhelpful implications 
that casting stewardship as a metaphor potentially have um, in that colloquial sense that we use it. And I won't repeat all of them that Christine mentioned, but um, one in particular is that there's an ownership issue around the world in terms of society and in, especially with religious connotations um, that originally have been associated with stewardship. Another one is often it's, it's a paternalistic uh, or a controlling aspect. And so, of course, we have the ball and cup in different ways. Uh, for those of you that are working with Julia and are fans of resilience, you know what happens when we try to control uh, these different uh, situations. Um, and, and then there's many others, but one uh, in particular that caught my attention was this idea that it actually um, it causes a schism between nature and people increasingly um, and, and a disconnect between our two systems when we break it apart and put a priority on humans or, and again, in the religious connotations through God as a way of knowing and controlling our particular systems. So n a number of these... Um, issues have been raised with the typical way that we've thought about stewardship. Interestingly, um, roughly 2000 to 2010, uh, stewardship often was used in, in that kind of colloquial sense. Frequently it still is used in that colloquial sense. But we've seen it really develop in the last three to four years into a much more of a multi-dimensional construct. And so a lot of that uh, construct, and I'm just going to highlight four different ways that we've come to use stewardship, and these are by no means mutually exclusive. I'm looking at Garrett in the back, and, and I've had the opportunity to, uh, to work with Garrett. It's great. It's better than looking at a speaking point. I can just look at somebody and go, yes, this, that was my speaking point. So I was actually going to uh, mention some of the work that Julie and I have been doing with Garrett around sense of place. And so one of the common ways in terms of a multidimensional construct that we've come to use stewardship now is as a particular value that we associate uh, typically with a landscape feature and people that hold those values then drive them to act in a particular way. So for example, if you've grown up or you have a cottage in a particular place, uh, for example, um, you've always fished a river that you grew up with, you go back home, fish it with family members, etc., cetera, and that becomes part of your home river and then maybe you're more inclined to undertake restoration activities in a particular place. Um, a second way that we've um, come increasingly to look at stewardship, and in particular Nathan Bennett and some colleagues around uh, local environmental stewardship, is um, to bring different aspects that constitute stewardship together. So Bennett, for example, um, looks at the individual actors, so who are those stewards that come together, so instead of one steward that has a relationship to a particular place, uh, he draws attention to multiple actors that come together. What are their motivations? So that value ethics piece, why do they want to really do this? And then what's their capacity to actually make and assert change to have some beneficial outcome? So that's a very different way to think about stewardship. Um, one of the ways that Julie and myself have been working on stewardship for the last four or five years, and we didn't start out with that focus, but it's kind of increasingly growing um, with much of what we're doing, is very much um, in line with sustainability science thinking. And so in line with sustainability science, we're concerned with how uh, different groups or constellations of individuals, organizations come together through their activities, through a collaborative process to actually shape those different trajectories. So you've heard about resilience, you've heard about transformation. How do we actually come together to negotiate in those power types of relations what we want that future to look like and then what actions are we going to work towards to shape that future? And how do we do that, whether it's adapting to change, whether it's transforming change, um, or how, how do we navigate those changes in the spirit of, of our complex uh, social ecological complexity as well as uncertainty. And, and so that, again, is a very different way to think about stewardship um, than that initial colloquial definition. One of the most recent ones uh, that Elmquist and, and uh, colleagues have come out with, and I find this interesting and, and hopefully it resonates with many of you, is the idea of uh, stewardship as a boundary object. And this um, idea of a boundary object to me is really interesting in the spirit of our conversation today around different terminology and how we use terms. And so in, this, uh, in, in their conceptualization at least, 
Stewardship is a boundary object because it allows many different uh, groups of scholars, of individuals to connect these different aspects in different ways. So it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And, and they say that's absolutely fine. That's a good thing that we can each connect with each other by using this term and it's okay that it's loose. It's okay that we're using it in different ways. And so they draw attention to uh, ethics, they draw attention to knowledge, they draw attention um, to agency on one hand. And, and then they ask the question, how does, that, how does that come together when we're thinking about actions and having outcomes about the particular environment as we're moving forward towards sustainability? And, and for them, the main point is, great, if steward some, stewardship is something that can connect us, so if it's an idea that we can all get around and talk about these ideas, that's a good thing. And I think that very much goes back to the spirit um, of the magnitude of why we need stewardship to address issues uh, like the Anthropocene. So let me uh, shift to my object, which is indeed a piece of firewood. So I'll give the piece of firewood to, to Julia. And um, I was really challenged by this whole object thing. This is, this is so different than what I'm used to. So I, uh, I spent a lot of time, probably more time than you care to uh, know about, trying to figure out what is the correct object. And the Google was not a lot of help, so don't bother Googling <laughs> the object for stewardship. But uh, I couldn't, what I, what I was going to bring in was a seedling that is uh, on the screen, a real one, but I couldn't bring myself to kill a real tree. So. Um, I brought in firewood instead. And, and what that represents, and, and the note that I want to leave you with, um, all joking around aside, is that f for me, um, this idea of stewardship, and, and I really like this idea of a boundary object, as these terms change over time, as we get to understand them in different ways, as we apply them as researchers in different ways, I think it's okay to have a relationship with them, um, both personally and professionally, that evolves with time. And so for myself, my wife Patty and I have 100 acres uh, that's a managed forest. We've planted uh, over 15,000 trees on our property. We harvest, we fish, we hunt, we work the land. Um, and to me that in some ways is very much akin to the colloquial definition that we have of stewardship uh, as it being a special place um, where, where we exercise with an ethic of care, that kind of land ethic that Leopold talked about. And yet, uh, as a scholar and, and looking as we move towards many of these other definitions and understanding of stewardship, I, I see those aspects also coming into play. And so the location of our, of our uh, cabin is actually a place where I started my PhD. It's one of my original field sites where groups actually did decide to come together and work towards um, uh, river management in this particular case. And I can see over time with my nieces and nephews how that idea of knowledge and agency and transformational change start to actually take hold um, and they're struggling. You know, we, we talk a lot about for school, for example, with, with young children and what is that going to mean and how do we actually move forward with these transformations. Um, and so whether it's on one end of the spectrum where you're actually planting trees or where you're cutting firewood out of the bush with your own hands to heat your house, I think there's a lot we can uh, relate to around stewardship. And I think it's okay that, that we engage with these uh, concepts in different ways in different times of our lives and relate to them. So that's it. Perfect. Thank you, Ryan. What we'll do now is again take a brief um, moment to give the floor to a smaller conversation. But I'd like you to keep in mind um, that one of the things that you'll generate over the coming couple of minutes is a, a, a question for the panel um, or a statement that relates to your own work and how it intersects your own thinking and how it intersects with these terms that could just be a statement of some ob observation that complements, extends, problematizes what you've heard, and it can have a question associated with it or not. Um, just this with a view to recognizing that an important part of this context today is the broader teaching, learning, knowledge sharing um, experiment that these kinds of events are. So back over to you, and I'll invite the panelists to also think of a question for another panelist. Now, I know that we're not going to have any problem finish, filling the next 38 minutes with conversation, but just to sort of put some of that onus on us as well. So over to you, and I will, apologies ahead of time, I'll interrupt us in about two minutes, and then we'll broaden the conversation out. Thank you.
conversation the three of us have just been having here that will remind us about the generalized focus of the session today. Um, this notion of terminology, terminological evolution, 
terminological kind of declarative definition versus the potential benefits of terminological ambiguity and conceptual creation. And, um, you know, not that we're going to arrive at any particular sets of conclusions uh, from today's conversation. I think that the best that we can hope for is the kinds of things that have already been happening, uh, the kinds of increasing precision and articulacy around the lineage genealogy application of these terms. But it's useful to sort of recognize this, you know, maybe keep this in the back of our mind of the next half hour or so is that um, each of these terms on one hand um, engages a moment, as each of the presenters have articulated, a geopolitical, uh, geological moment, a human moment, a multi-species moment where there's an awareness of genuine crisis. Um, and so is it valuable having precise understandings of specific terms that can be mobilized for specific reasons uh, around policy or action, and is specificity useful uh, to apply terms in particular ways? To what extent, on the other hand, do we want to keep open the notion of terms that can evolve, that can, uh, through the work uh, of thought, uh, and have new connotations, new valences? We've heard in some of the scholars presenting today, uh, you know, Brian's recent, his sort of uh, moment of sort of articulating a new perspective on stewardship for example, that adds to the archive of understanding of what kind of work that term can do. So let's just keep in the back of our mind the notion that we're not moving towards any conclusive statements, but let's be aware that we're looking at this sort of continue on one hand of um, terminological application and precision and how that's useful uh, for the specific context that we're in, but also the very uh, and this is a provocative statement from uh, Christine's perspective, perhaps, the extent to which the very human work of a certain type of thinking generates possibilities for terms that keeps uh, different futures available for us, perhaps terms that uh, don't appear here, words that haven't been invented yet. So well, let's keep that tension in mind. Um, given that we, the majority of the, of the uh, talk has come from this side of the table, uh, perhaps we could begin with some observations about your own practice and thinking, some questions to initiate the next and final phase of our meeting here today. So over, over to you folks. Who's going to take the, the plunge into the increasingly warm waters of the... Everyone's eyes are down. I know, I know. <laughs> Maybe do need a theater as it Yes, please. Uh, just on the, on the... Oh, would you mind telling us just briefly who you are? Just... My name's Mark. I'm a first year student and master of sustainability program here. Um, I wanted to bring up something just on the point of consumerism. I think a big part of the, the, the whole dynamic of it is... Um, how we relate to one another. I didn't, I grew up in a suburb. I didn't grow up in a small community. I knew a few of my neighbors, the ones where, like the houses in which my friends grew up, and the one who used to yell at me for jumping over a fence or back here to get to another friend's house. Uh, but generally, I didn't know people on my street. I didn't really know the people in my neighborhood. So one of the ways that I think we can relate to each other is, oh, you're wearing a brand I like. Or when I go to, say, a Mount of Quinn Co-op, these are people I can relate to. These are people who I share at least some interests with. So I think part of the, the reason for the explosion of consumerism is that there's a there's a social element and there are social connections that we can make in a time when maybe we're becoming increasingly disconnected because the need for that social connection isn't really there because again we're not, we're not growing up in those small towns where everyone's parents works at the local factory or the That's great. Yeah, that's a good point. I think that's one of the ways that consumerism itself is marketed is community building. That uh, that's the way we develop aff uh, affinities with each other um, and commonalities. I think it's problematic because there are other ways of building community you know, besides this. But it's very interesting. I was doing a, uh, some reading on um, brand loyalty and uh, the communities that build up around specific brands. Um, and the attempts of corporations are doing to build uh, connections between consumers, um, like fan groups, that kind of thing, to uh, deepen brand loyalty and attachment and commitment to commodities. 
So, I mean, all brands are different, all companies are different, but some uh, can really have really built communities, like Harley Davidson was one I was reading about, where they have an annual uh, gathering down in the States and something like 50,000 people go to that and all right in their Harleys and they have, you know, many Facebook groups and online uh, discussions. And of course, Apple uh, is another one where people can have very, very deep uh, commitments to. Um, so I think in, in, in a sense you're right, uh, especially post-World War II, which is really when I think since uh, when consumerism took off, that it was uh, a way, it's a bit of a chicken and egg question which came first, but it um, either to compensate for a lack of community and growing isolation and fragmentation, um, or whether that isolation and fragmentation happened because our identities were already shifting towards commodities. But uh, I think it's, it's uh, problematic because there's a lot of other things that are left out of a community when we think of just a community of consumers. Um, and I think it's, what I want to suggest also as a next step is, what I want to think about is an idea of a community resistors, um, in a sense that there can be a community of people that are opposing consumerism, uh, and that can be a kind of a counter community. Very useful, thank you. Um, would you would, is there anything you'd like to sort of a, a address back, or? What does that spark for you? Can I jump in? Yeah, please, please absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've got much more experienced um, critical social theorists in the room, so correct me if I go astray. But I'm pretty sure that Marx was one of the ones who originally pointed out that one of the fundamental contradictions within a um, consumer-based society is that it's not fulfilling for humans to be consumers in comparison to the kind of satisfaction that you can draw from being a producer. So this shift towards a consumer culture is actually very corrosive to us as communities. Whereas before, where we were producer communities, say Julia made shoes and Ryan made the milk and Christine made whatever, I would interact with them and they would have a fulfilling, um, yes, exactly. They would have a fulfilling experience. Um, and then we would build closer connections through that type of um, society and that this consumerism is, is uh, is fundamentally flawed and doesn't actually lead to community building or a sense of fulfillment within our communities the way it, it would have before. Essentially, yeah, that's what I've been thinking about, that the communities we're building as consumers displaces our other forms of community, but also allegiance. Mm -hmm. And I've always been struck uh, whenever the um, retail, uh, retail workers go on strike, I wonder whether um, people that shop there are going to identify with the workers that are on strike mm -hmm. and be sympathetic. Or are they going to feel like, no, you're impeding my life of consumerism, and I forget my potential identifications with you as a as a worker? So I think I mentioned earlier this idea of uh, shifting from citizen identity, consumer identity, and I think you're pointing out as well this idea that there's a shift from production identity, which Marx said essentially forms our consciousness. Our consciousness is shaped by labor and by the ownership of the means of production. But what I'm suggesting now uh, is more that our identity and our consciousness is shaped by, by consumption. Yeah, and there's a lot of really interesting scholarship about um, the production of one's own identity as a form of labor that does not necessarily benefit but continues to alienate the self. And it's the platform capitalists who are benefiting because the labor that we do to construct our social media presences, for example, the value does not accrue to us, but actually very financially accrues to them, right? So there's the internalization of this process of commodification. There's a question down here. Um, just wanted your opinion on, on the thought Can you introduce you yourself? So it's mostly a, a comment, but maybe a, your opinion on, on, on that as well. It seems to me that a lot of, uh, many of you mentioned, maybe all of you mentioned something about um, imagining and the difficulty of imagining possible solutions, possible futures, or transformations that were unimaginable to a certain point. Um, and I think ties well with this idea of being producers, but rather being creators of, um, of new ideas and imagined places. Um, in any exercise of thinking about technology concepts or ideas, it's also an exercise of gathering and assembling new forms of thinking about things. Um, but sometimes we lose track of what 
what we are talking about and what actually exists. And that's the gap that might put us away or distance from the future we're trying to imagine. Um, so my question right now, or your reaction, is how can we think of new ways of imagining through such a, um, a no type of thinking, which is to think about terminologies and concepts and how creative this can be? Yeah, I could just jump in there. I mean, I think um, a variety of contemporary philosophers will discuss the ways in which traditional images of thought mm -hmm. deal with notions of representation, mm -hmm. uh, replication, mm -hmm. or are fundamentally identitarian in that the concept itself is an object and by extension in this conversation a commodity, but there are perhaps other models of imagining ontology that um, foreground creative dynamics at the heart of the production of any particular phenomena, regardless what that, of what that phenomena is, um, be it a biological organism or the work of thinking itself. Um, and so, you know, some of the most interesting post-humanist thought that I've encountered addresses the, the very way in which certain rationalist enlightenment forms of thinking that have been productively critiqued by the panel here necessarily engender commodification, necessarily engender industrial activity, necessarily engender alienation through that application of identitarian premises. Mm -hmm. And that uh, other forms of thinking that are predicated on processuality, on ontologies uh, that don't have supremacy at the heart of two different modes of substance, provide the space for that kind of thinking. Um, then there's, of course, just the simple work that uh, artists do all the time of, of imagining different futures. We had a quick conversation about how science fiction, and not just contemporary science fiction, Julie was referencing older science fiction, you know, 50 years ago, that is imagining crises that we find ourselves in now. So perhaps there's sort of something inherent in that, what we might broadly call creative act, mm -hmm. that has that possible for fresh, possibility for fresh imaginings. Yeah. I just wanted to add, uh, you know, thank you very much for your question. I think this idea around process, which David brings up, is, is very much at the heart of, of what our line of research on environmental stewardship is all about. It's, it's looking into what are those mechanisms by which people can actually come together and, and through those interactions start to imagine different futures and then actually how can we facilitate um, them coming together to actually realize, you know, the unknown. And by trying things, how can they take those um, and reflect on, on what they produce and then change those activities so they incrementally start moving towards a different future trajectory? And I think we've, we haven't paid near enough attention in that process piece. So just in the stewardship side of things, but I know also in terms of the resilience and somewhat towards adaptation and transformation, it's... How do we start thinking about those process spaces or platforms that enable people to do that where in the past we haven't? So we very much focused on those individuals or, or kind of these larger structures. And so there's this movement, I think, much more. And, and there's two individuals in the room, and I don't want to put people on the spot, but both, you know, Brooke and, and Garrett that I know in their own ways are very actively looking at these. And so I think that they really on to something um, that I would encourage you to think about. And, and that there's a number of us in this room that are working in that space to try to figure out and better understand what are these processes where we haven't made these, these tractionable uh, progresses as we could. Thank you. I think Christine has an observation as well. Well, it, just in terms of method, um, it's something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, what could a post-humanist method be? And, and I think that trying to do things differently, asking my colleagues to think about an object and giving Ryan a, a hard time on this, right? And, and circulating the object, you know, you, you, I, I was looking at how it was being circulated and, and just like to engage with an object and try to think what is that, 
triggering in, in my mind and how does it force me to think about these things differently or David asking us to have these, you know, these little conversations and, and whatnot, like breaking formats, breaking ways of doing things that we're so used to and, and, and being willing to get into an uncomfortable zone um, and say, where, where is that going to take us, right? And, and talk across disciplinary divides and, and whatnot, having people from all kinds of horizons and and then become, I think taming the discomfort we feel with lack of this uh, of um, of um, definitional clarity um, which is something you were bringing up earlier because the more we cling to the idea that we need to be able to define something the less creative we are and the less we can come up with with new ideas and and perhaps not be so bogged down with okay what does that mean um and and be willing to use it in all kinds of ambiguous ways um and and be creative so yes the meaning of words matter but we need to also be willing to um, continue using them, you know, being cognizant of how, what they mean and how they've come to mean what they do, but also be willing to be creative with that, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Jo? Uh, yes, I'm Jo, um, and I'm in the Interdisciplinary Humanities PhD program, and I'm working with David. Um, something that sort of floated through all of your conversations, uh, but something that sort of raised for me a sort of a question of, situ uh, sort of positionality is um, this notion of power, the, the, the way that these terms can be used as, as, in a, as a form of power. And, and I'm just thinking that as we're wrestling with these words in the forms that we're dealing with them here, um, what is the danger of them becoming a sort of this whole conversation becoming in you know, in sort of an academic Western industrialized conversation and forgetting that there are people um, that don't have these terms in their language or the terms in their cultures. And how do we avoid getting into a situation of sort of a, sort of a colonialism ourselves as we rethink the future um, in that sense? So I think, Ryan, you've mentioned some new ways of thinking about working with other people, but I, I just wondered um, how, as just a discipline in a university or in, a, in an academic discourse, one pre prevents or can be addressing that. Any thoughts? I mean, a lot of um, people here, oh, sorry, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm thrilled that you've raised that point because that's a really critical part of this discussion. Um, and I think it's part of what motivates my interest in engaging with the word um, transformation is the recognition that it is it has the potential to be used in a very colonial way in that there's funding, a lot of funding for aid with many strings attached. It applies to resilience, it applies to sustainability. And so it can be part of that big colonial um, machine that dictates very real funding circumstances, policy terms for countries which mightn't have any engagement with these words but have very real consequences playing out within um, communities where I work, for example. Um, the flip side of my more optimistic hat, um, I think that one of the things that is becoming very well recognized and accepted amongst the, uh, let's call them like the global change thinkers, is that we need more uh, voices in that conversation. And so if you look at the evolution of the IPCC authorship, for example, there is a mandatory requirement that each working group be led by a, a Western thinker or a developed country thinker and someone from uh, one of those non-Western countries. So um, if I'm being optimistic, I would, I would say that I think that that point is being recognized and that it's a very, Eurocentric view that's dominated much of the research in this space, um, but I, I think that that's becoming more and more recognized as problematic. And Jill, I just want to you know thank you certainly for for your question, and I think it's an important acknowledgement. And, and just to build on on Jess's comment, a, a number of the places that we've done work, um, for example, small scale fishing in Uruguay. I mean, we we it's it's the phenomena. It's these. Um, that we're interested in, we purposely don't use any of the terminology that we do in a setting like this. And so to Christine's point about uh, or, uh, useful ambiguity, 
or uh, you know, there's an, a time and a place when precision of terminology is critically important when you're defending your thesis and your external examiner says, I need to know how you use this term and what operational measures you use. You know, yes, terminology is incredibly important. <laughs> However, uh, you know, it's, it's critical of us as, as world citizens to recognize, and one of the things with stewardship as we're new, newly understanding it, is there's a plurality of knowledges. And this is a big part of what we study in sustainability science. So it's not one way of knowing. There's plural ways of knowledge that we actually engage with others uh, around these ideas. And so, you know, I think it's, it's a really important caveat to a conversation like this, that there's a per, uh, you know, particular audience that we're having this conversation with. There are times when I think it's really important to have that precision, and there's other times when I think we should throw it down the drain and concentrate on how people in a particular place are engaging and working, and all of these ideas around power relations come into play, and we need to be very cognizant of those and navigate those in the, in the proper space and time that we're dealing with them. So a wonderful question and you know again I think that's a really important thing to be cognizant of where we're working and how we're working. Yeah, and arguably even that level of care and the ability to translate in different circumstances um, is equally important if you're working in wetlands on, on some level. Yeah. There might not be the significant differences uh, that one would have if you were working in the global south for example but nonetheless you know there's whole sort of notions of intellectual capital is frequently associated with uh, research and terminology that can block useful allyship and solidarity on, on much more local levels as well. Yes? Um, I'm Mitch. I'm also in the interdisciplinary committee's program. Um, and the thought that I, didn't, I was just thinking about after listening to particularly Christine and Frederick's comments, um, who want to talk about some of these ideas in a place based setting. Um, when I was back at home in Michigan over break, um, and saw this commercial um, of this uh, Michigan NGO, a pro hunting NGO, that posits that hunters in Michigan who buy fishing and hunting licenses are the stewards of sustainable development for posterity in Michigan because their hunting licenses and things go to the Park Service in Michigan. And so this is an anthropocentric type of sustainability that posits humans as stewards through this paternalistic relationship with the environment. But to Trevor's point, it kind of institutes this transactional relationship that I pay to hunt, and therefore I expect in return to acquire animals. And the more I would learn about some of these hunting type dynamics in the States, and when I went out west and things like that, to see that these populations are all managed by the government. So in Michigan, for example, these fish that people fish in the Great Lakes, a lot of them are hatched in hatcheries, in an industrial hatchery setting, and then they're loaded up into airplanes, and then they're thrown into the lakes, and then people catch them, and they do this every year to manage the stocks, and, and things like that. So it, it, just the mechanization of sustainability for, literally for human posterity, and it's sort of this facade, for example. So when I was in um, South Dakota, I was in a state park in South Dakota, and you can go and you can do almost like a safari tour and look at bison and different animals. And then in the brochure, they say, yeah, look at these wild bison. This is one of the only places in the United States that has these animals that have been here for thousands of years, and isn't so wonderful, and then you can come back in like August and participate in their roundup. And so they bring, they round up all the bison into some stadium and then they'll call them and do various things like that. So just the way consumerism has impacted our environmental man management as well in the business model or um, something like that is, is on our mind and is a, quite a gap between some of the conversations we've been having here, whether they be philosophical or leftist political and what types of on the ground policies are going on now and how it's become much more worse in the states with the privatization of public lands. So we heard? Yeah. Um, yeah, I really struck by a few things you said. This idea that um, 
that uh, with regard to the hunting licenses and that kind of thing, that is, the sustainability in that context is only for you so you can hunt. Like you're only, you not only that you're pointing out two points, when you're paying for the license and that's where one notion of sustainability comes from or contribution, but the other is uh, uh, ultimately is so you, so you can hunt. You're not actually contributing to the uh, well-being of nature unless it's, again, like the consumer mentality, unless it's of, of use. Uh, but I thought there's another aspect that, we're, that you're getting at, which is that, in that example, is that the motive for being involved in, in stewardship or, or any kind of uh, ongoing relationship with nature is self-interest. And I think that's what consumerism appeals to. And I think that's what I was getting at earlier about the idea that it's the world we, we adopt. And going back to the point about community, one of the things that consumerism teaches us, it kind of separates us uh, into, into uh, autonomous units or so we've seen. Uh, and then speak to us in the language of self-interest. And I think this idea that um, buying a license so you can get a hunt already plays into that into that mentality. But I think there's also a lot of um, confusion in, in the sense that we sometimes some things can appear to be uh, non-self-interested when they actually are self-interested or vice versa. So I used to be a tree planter when I was doing my undergraduate degree, uh, and I did for about a decade. Um, and people would say to me, oh, isn't that great? You're, you must be a real environmentalist. You're kind of helping renew the forest. Uh, and I planted about 500,000 trees, and people say, wow, isn't that great? You can look back, but, you know, how big would that area be? But in reality, actually, it was not a regenerative process. It was actually turning natural, turning forest into a farm for trees, where they would essentially spray chemicals to con uh, kill competing uh, species, they would determine what tree they plant there, not based as much on the ecosystem or based on the monetary value or the, what they anticipate the market might be at some point. Uh, so I think that, that example always stood out to me as um, one where we can misrepresent uh, stewardship pretty easily. We have about five minutes left, so I think realistically there's time for one more question. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of interested in like the concept of uh, commons. Um, and going back to talking about uh, community, I think uh, it's similar to the commons in that sense, um, but it's also kind of different, like Jessica was saying about how there is sort of like an ecosystem of producers um, beforehand, you know, we would have all of our different roles and we would sort of share each different sort of production. Um, and I think that has a lot to do like with how we can maybe go forward, and, and there's a lot of how the commons relates to the terms that we also talked about, um, and in, in broader terms, just like environmental sustainability as well. Um, like for example, um, if you have a community and there's a lot more of a, of a consciousness of, of the commons, um, you know, Whereas now everyone, for example, has has their own lawnmower, right? But do we do we all need like a lawnmower? You know, if we all shared uh, more of these resources, I think there would be a better uh, a better sense of uh, sustainability and uh, more environmental consciousness as well. I just want to see if you guys can speak to the commons and, and the relations to that. If I could just begin by, if, are you sort of coming at this from Hart and Negri's notion of the common and commonwealth? Um, uh, sort of. Sorry, sorry, I'm not sure. Yeah, I just I thought I'd throw that reference in. It's a useful distinction. Hart and Negri in the, the, the three volumes, beginning with Empire, Multitude, and Commonwealth. In Commonwealth, they resuscitate the notion of the common. And very importantly, determined that that is outside the notion of public or private. So usually we think of the common as something that's a public good, um, but they suggest that the way in which state, the state apparatus has captured uh, the collective wealth is in this particular moment with the particular kind of constitutional historical arrangements that we have in social democracies and economic north, that those are entirely oriented towards very specific modes of exploitive production. So even the state or public good is not necessarily uh, speaking to a broader common good. So a, a, useful, a useful nuance for, for this notion of the commons to recognize that there are spaces that are outside this false dichotomy of private public that actually um, 
once once stepping outside of that the fresh kinds of possibilities that you're referring to perhaps have more radical potential than they would if we just say well let's establish a new government organization so that would be sort of one sort of addition to your to the thinking there is to imagine spaces outside of that yeah and i mean protests like uh anti-pipeline protests you know that have a very different language around sustainability than what Mitch is referring to around sort of sustainability you know these are sort of third spaces liminal spaces different spaces outside that um very kind of closed loop that presumes to capture all available understandings of ownership right yeah, i was going to connect these these last two comments because i think there is a real uh, strong connection uh, and as you were speaking david about these spaces outside and i wonder how much of this you know, are the resilience traps that Julia mentioned mm -hmm. in terms of the systems that the state has set up in your example around tags, for example, for wildlife and quotas as a state apparatus. But then I think that we could take it one step further because, I mean, it really comes from Austin's work in, in our uh, world in terms of common property and that notion of the commons. And we can think of oceans, for example, as, the, you know, um, Fickert's done some wonderful work in terms of, of oceans and, and, and those as common properties. But back to your notion around hunting tags, I, I'm really curious about two things. And first of all, how do you see them, Julia, as a trap potentially? And then second of all, if we reimagine these spaces differently as David's encouraging us to, how could we think of, of reconceptualizing something in terms of transformation of how we would transform, for example, go, Michigan's hunting structure around tags? So two things that these questions really sparked in my mind. And so I, I'm crossing out a bunch of questions I had for my colleagues and challenging them each with a, a different one. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about traps and then you can take it from there. Uh, and I actually have one tiny little addition to make this Perfect. unrelated, but um, so yes, absolutely. So traps, um, one of the, the ways in which traps can kind of manifest themselves is in slow variables. So when from kind of resilience language, and I'm trying to be cognizant that, um, you know, a lot of the words that we're using, it's obvious, have different meanings, even, you know, across the panel and certainly, you know, within the room. So um, slow variables are things that don't change quickly. They, they occur in nature and they occur in social systems, certainly. Um, and, and, you know, regulations, laws, um, uh, people's values, uh, social norms, these are things that generally tend to change very slowly. And so when you have a certain way of doing something, like you have um, a, an approach to managing a population of wildlife, whatever it is, by using hunting tags, um, you know, society gets used to that way of doing things. That becomes the norm. That's how, that's how we hunt. Um, and that becomes extremely difficult to change because if you do try to change it, you feel a lot of resistance from those slow variables. Um, society may not want to see that change. There's going to be all sorts of opposition. Um, and so I think, you know, it's a really good example of how we can kind of trap ourselves unknowingly often um, in situations where it's a very difficult to, to actively, you know, move ourselves into, into a new way of doing things. Um, and, you know, the, I'd say another one is the idea of, you know, having, having your own lawnmower. That's kind of entrenched in, uh, you know, not everywhere in the world, certainly, but I would say, you know, especially in the suburbs of uh, various Canadian cities, and, and I'm sure in the U.S. too, that your property is yours. Mm -hmm. um, that's a very strong feeling that people have. And I, I come from a farm, and, um, and there is that feeling there too with, you know, people who own land, that the land is yours. Um, and so pushing back against that can be very challenging. Um, the other thing that I just want to mention before we go, and I'm sorry to break kind of the line of thought, but I mean, what we're talking about here is also what constitutes stewardship too. I think there's a lot of questions, even if, you know, conceptual vagueness is okay, um, it does cause these debates among, you know, if I, if I pay for my hunting tag and that money is used for you know some sort of conservation measure, is that not stewardship? Is it stewardship? Um, and you know different people are going to have different perspectives on that. 
Or if you don't pay for your hunting tag or you steal somebody's lawnmower, you get charged because that's become an entrenched norm and now you're breaking the law. So it's complicated. It's complicated. It's complicated. <laughs> Well, they're in the design principles. <laughs> um, I would like to say that this is a very nice segue, so I can plug something I'm working on. <laughs> I'm I might be finishing with this too. Uh, so. Perfect. So I am currently co-editing a special feature in the journal Ecology and Society, and if you go on their website, it's on the front page, and it's called Breaking Social Ecological Traps, Transformations Towards Sustainability. So we put a lot of keywords in there. But essentially, it's a collection of case studies from around the world. So it's things like uh, log, illegal logging in Ghana um, to uh, shell handicrafts by women's groups in Solomon Islands and in Tanzania. So it's a compilation of from the ground stories on how communities are trying to uh, effectively break social ecological traps. And we are doing a review of these um, 10 or 12 case studies and trying to look for common pathways forward. And so some of the things, the editorial is about to be submitted, so it'll come out in the next few months, hopefully. Um, but it's pathways and, and things that were brought up already, such as um, engaging more voices in the conversations about how we manage these common areas. Um, empowering women is one that keeps emerging as an influential potential pathway out of these entrenched traps. Um, so. Uh, I'll leave it there as I go read online because there's some really good case studies and hopefully a pretty um, compelling editorial that will be out soon. Perfect. Well, thanks everyone for your um, rich participation in the course of the afternoon. We certainly hope it's been generative for you. Thank you also to the panelists for your time and for uh, conceiving of this event. And, thanks to you, um, David. My mm -hmm. pleasure. Mm -hmm. It's been a real dream to speak with everyone. And um, with any luck, we'll see each other again soon in a similar context. Thank you. Thank you.